interesting mathematics. And so sorry, uh, that, that was my fault, Prof. I, I just reminded okay, Jake. Okay, I just okay. reminded Jake to record. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. And um, so to conclude, when we're creating, I think uh, I use Hilbert's words, we are entering into a paradise from which no one can drive us out. Thank you. All right. So to move on to the other team to rebut, I'm going to ask Professor Joseph Lowry. And um, one plus one equals two, right? You can't argue with that. But actually, mathematicians are pretty creative magicians. Some will say that one plus one equals zero sometimes. I'm pretty sure you yourself has probably taught this in one of your classes. And the same holds for many other statements. And for example, parallel lines never meet, or Pythagoras theorem. Yeah, sometimes will be true or false, it depends, right? So isn't mathematics a little bit like statistics? You can mold it, you can create illusions, you can give different interpretations and meanings to statements. There's nothing solid to be discovered. So you need to unmute. Okay. All, right. All right, let me answer your question with some questions. Um, before humans created prime numbers, let's say they created prime numbers, was it possible to arrange 11 pebbles in a rectangular grid? I think so, because 11 is prime, but prime numbers hadn't been created yet. Um, before humans created parabolas, I mean, the prehistoric man threw a stone at somebody. Uh, would, that, would the trajectory of that stop be a parabola, which has not yet been created? And another example, uh, the Greeks knew about the platonic solids, of, of course. Uh, the, you can even talk about the plane, a plane triangle. But let's say, take the tetrahedron. They knew about it, they created. Okay, let's say the tetrahedron. But the groups weren't yet created. So at that time, the tetrahedron didn't have its 12 symmetries or it had this 12 symmetries. What if it had the alternating group already existed before we created it? I mean, briefly, the, the, this is why I believe that, that I feel that mathematics is discovered. Prime number 11 was prime before humans uh, came into this universe, and it will remain prime after humans uh, leave the universe. What we create, yes, we create mathematics, uh, we create uh, uh, the study of those prime numbers. It's like we are in a dark room, a black room, and we decide uh, what torch lights to, to, to turn on, uh, where to point it, how to look at those things. So maybe another culture would look at numbers that would study other properties of those numbers. Uh, but the properties are there, uh, and in my opinion, the objects are already there. Uh, we create the way of doing it. I mean, one plus one equals zero, one plus one equals two. It's a different one. How often do we tell the students, you know, write the one for the group, write the one for the, uh, for the real numbers. So say, ah, this is not the same one. You know, this is the one, the identity of the group. This is the one, uh, the real numbers. So your one plus one equals two was the one in the binary, uh, in the, the field of order two. And the one plus one, uh, sorry, equals zero. And one plus one equals two uh, was probably the real numbers uh, or, or, or the natural numbers. So uh, I don't think there's a contradiction in that. Um, uh, the, uh, certainly there is problem with Platonism. There are some problems uh, and uh, Especially, you know, things like the continuum hypothesis being independent of the of, of the axioms and so on. Fine, and some ref, the refuge for many, uh, for all, I suppose, the refuge is formalism. You know, to say that uh, for a formalist, the motto is, you know, for, for a formalist, uh, don't ask me what the number two is. I don't care. What I care is what it does. Okay, it's like a game. I mean, if I'm teaching you chess. Uh, don't ask me, but what is a rook? Uh, 
I don't care. Okay, we represent it as a, as a, as a tower. I don't care what it is, what I care is how it captures, how it moves, so on and so forth. But I've never seen a chess problem which has an impact on anything outside of chess. However, uh, in this game called mathematics, it has an enormous impact uh, on, on life, on reality. I mean, would it possibly be that uh, this is a game which by a lucky coincidence has these applications? Uh, I'm reminded of uh, that famous uh, essay by Eugene Wigner, the physicist, uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Uh, now, he was one of the persons who introduced group theory into, into, into quantum physics and so on. Uh, for the Platonist, the Platonist has uh, his or her own set of problems to, to, to justify Platonism. But for a formalist, I think, I mean, looking at mathematics simply uh, as uh, a game, a formal game, makes the unreasonable effectiveness even more unreasonable. Um, now, I, 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 I agree with sort of both point of views, the formalists, and uh, in fact, you know the joke that uh, uh, a working mathematician from Monday to Friday, from nine till five, is a Platonist. Uh, or she's a platonist and uh, but then in the evening or in the weekends to relax and he meets his uh, philosoph philosophy friends then he's a formalist yeah. so uh, please conclude not, but notwithstanding notwithstanding i still i still believe uh, that uh, these uh, things are over there um it, it's very difficult to understand how uh, People working in two different areas, a hundred years later, uh, person A, person B are working in different areas. A hundred years later, person B discovers through mathematical uh, connections that what they are doing is sort of the same thing, as the same uh, connections, as, as the same equations. I mean, some people say, oh, that's because our brain is wired that way and we can only see what is mathematical, but that's what we are. Yes, okay, well, so we're seeing a blinkered view of the universe, but look at its effects. We're talking right now, you know, without, in different rooms in different countries. Um, so it is a blinkered view, but still, I think it is a real view. It's a view of certain objects which are, which are existing there. I mean, uh, one can go into a more philosophical, technical details. For example, there's realism. Uh, realists sort of believe that, I don't know exactly the distinction, but realists believe that the properties of mathematical objects uh, exist. Uh, uh, we don't create them. But that doesn't imply, apparently, that the objects themselves exist. Okay? I don't know exactly technically how it goes, but I'm happy in any case, uh, even with a, a realist who is a weak Platonist uh, because of the existence. And uh, if you want to see uh, an eminent Platonist today arguing, Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose, uh, the, the, there's a clip uh, or in an interview on YouTube. He's probably the most eminent uh, Platonist uh, living at the moment. And he says, you know, I mean, no, Newton uh, didn't have data to back up what he did. I mean, the data was very poor. Even Einstein, the theories which they, uh, they, they produced not only explained the little data that they had, but explained much, much more than they had ever even supposed. Even the inventors of the theory uh, couldn't uh, anticipate what they found. Where was this thing that which, uh, these things which the theory found it existed. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next. Um, on the other team, we have Ethan James. I'm going to ask you um, the following. Um, many theorems in mathematics started off as conjectures, right, by observing specific examples. But just as many of these conjectures are proved as are falsified. It is not up to mathematicians to decide which. Uh, for example, if I tell you that in 20 years time, the twin prime conjecture is going to be proved false, then that means that today, um, there's a finite number of twin primes. 
So in what sense are theorems created? What choice do we have? Well, uh, our, well, let us start with the, the idea of definitions. At the end of the day, mathematicians uh, observe a pattern in nature uh, or in, in the nature of the objects that we're studying and we define uh, a pro that, that property and we explore that property in the sense that uh, our definitions can always uh, kind of decide something like we use our formal logic to uh, make uh, conclusions uh, based on our definitions. So uh, take for an example, uh, continuity. So uh, we start by imagining continuity as uh, uh, a line and, and we, we keep uh, that, that, you know, you can't take the pencil off the paper and whatever. Uh, all of this, you know, the idea that as close as more as much as you zoom in, you know, uh, there's always that that continuity. We could we define it then using the epsilon delta definition, uh, and that can then be further generalized to, uh, uh, you know, we we see that the only thing that this depends on is distance. The idea of distance, and and that can then be you know used to 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 kind of extend this theory to an even more further abstract theory. So uh, to, to come back to your question, uh, the idea of abstraction, yes, may eventually uh, solve these things uh, and, and will eventually, yes, you're right. They may be true in the sense that our theorems are currently true. Uh, our conjectures are currently true or false, obviously. Uh, but how this, uh, how we eventually come up with this idea that they are true or false, that is then a path of creation. We are creating the, the uh, thoughts and the, uh, the steps that we are uh, putting forward to uh, kind of decide. At the end of the day, we use logic to, uh, uh, to decide whether one thing is true or not. So if one thing is true or not, uh, that is a path of creation at the end of the day, because that works based off our axioms, which we have created. Uh, yeah. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to move now to the other team. Um, which says that mathematics is discovered. So I'm going to ask Adriana um, uh, what she thinks about it. Um, so logic is given, right? We can't wake up one day, invent a new logic and toss the old one away and expect everyone to tag along. Presumably you would argue the same thing about mathematics, but one can invent computers and programming languages, and one can use them creatively to solve problems. Can't one say that uh, the reason mathematics is so successful in modeling nature is because it was invented on purpose to solve problems? Mm. So it's definitely um, used like practically for computers, for uh, all, all these applications, but can you say that we invented logic? Because what, what is a computer really? A computer is just the physical embodiment of uh, logic, basically. You give it commands and it, and it does them all in order. It, it can't, a computer can't defy logic. You know, you have the whole thing problem. It, 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 I mean, it's proven that even with all the technology we have, we can't, create problems that defy logic. And I think that's the intrinsic structure of mathematics is the consistency. Um, while we may say, you can say that you create an axiom, but you can't just pick anything that's anything, you know, the, these axioms don't come from a vacuum. Um, first, they come from observations. And 
it, it's so intrinsically linked with our reality because our reality is it, it's logical you don't have um uh, it, the sky is, is blue it's not yellow you know <laughs> um I, I think to me mathematics as as a body it's it's like a city so you have what you want to prove and you have your location where you are right now what you're taking as assumptions the part from your assumptions to what you want to prove it, it, it's there it's either there or it's not right so you can take one part you can take another part it doesn't matter and and that sort of thing is the creative part of it but it's not creation the part is still there whether you find it or not right you can you can uh, two mathematicians right when they're given uh, the same problem can come to very different conclusions they, they they can come to very different proofs right but they're either it's either true or it's false if a mathematician gives me a proof of something I can look at it and I can be convinced because we we, we both start at the same point and um, it, it it's it's in the nature of mathematics. And I think that's why it's so evident in nature now is because, um, because of how consistent it is, right? From whichever axioms you start, there are things you can prove, there are things you can't prove, there are things that are false. And of, of course, mathematics is creative, but it's not the same as creation. You have to think outside the box to find the correct part, maybe you have to jump over a wall or whatever. But the part is still there and you're still able to get there regardless. I think that's it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so um, I'll turn again to the side which says that mathematics is created. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Luke Collins. Mm -hmm. I'm going to posit you the challenge that uh, Professor Lowry has made to you. Um, I'm going to ask it in this way, however. Kepler discovered that planets move around the sun in ellipses. Now, do you believe that they have orbited around the sun in ellipses for millions of years before humans were even existed? Okay, and so didn't ellipses I'm exist sorry. before humans? <clears throat> I want a straight answer, please. Yes or no? Okay, so. But you asked two questions there. Like you said something, you said Alex says existed before humans. That, that second bit, no. But the first part, also sort of no. So I, I think the issue is we're not being existential enough here. What do I mean by this? So Lowry gave also the very good example of like, you know, aligning pebbles in 11, like in, in a row of 11. You can never make a rectangle out of that. Um, obviously, I agree with that fact. And also, uh, in a sense, so I don't want, you know, the the other side is sort of framing the argument in such a way that it's as if we are disagreeing with the effectiveness of mathematics. That's not what we're disagreeing with. Obviously, I mean, I study mathematics not because I think it's useless or ineffective. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I like it and I, I think it's useful. But what we're saying is um, whether we discover something, whether these things that we discover, these truths that we obtain, whether they are this sort of saying that they are discovered implies that they are of some sort of cosmic importance. Okay, so first of all, as any physicist might, you know, be the first to admit, all models of physical reality are technically wrong in the sense that they, pre they predict what happens, but they never predict with entire accuracy because mathematics always deals with idealized models of situations, right? So, um, so I forgot who mentioned this, but someone mentioned it. The, the, I believe the, we can interject and I'll be the first to do it. And wrong <laughs> is a bad word there, sir. Approximation is not incorrect, right? I, I, I'd like you to, to, to clarify that point. Thank you. you. Okay, you can bound the error. Okay, yes. But, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so my response to that interjection will be show me then or prove the existence of an exact model or, you know, justify. Like the, the alternative to that is like you're saying that there exists. I just Somehow. Sorry. yes. As Box said, all models are wrong. Some yes, are used. exactly. Some are used. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Yeah, yeah, this is this is of course. I mean, so someone mentioned the analogy of a game, right? Like mathematics is like a game. We make up the rules and so on. Um, but the issue is so first of all, saying mathematics is discovered implies because 
we need to sort of understand the semantics of what we're saying here. What, what, what does it mean to say mathematics is discovered? It means to say that these objects somehow, um, we are discovering fundamental truths about the universe or some, something of cosmic importance. That's what I understand by saying mathematics is discovered. Now, I think that this is inaccurate because mathematics is fundamentally anthropocentric, right? Like it's, it's concerned with things which humans are concerned about, okay? Um, and even the, method, the things we choose to study, the things we choose to model and so on, they're based first of all of, of our observations. I mean, yes, obviously I agree. Mathematics is effective. We can go to the moon and so on. I'm not saying like, you know, don't like, I'm not denying the fact that I'm not like a moon landing denier or anything, you know? And um, what I'm saying is that even though mathematics is effective, Okay, our observation, so it is useful and so on and so on, but it is the truths that we claim in mathematics are not, we're not discovering fundamental truths about the universe. Okay, we're, we're discovering fun, we're, we're, so uh, let me phrase it this way. Okay, so we are the arbiters of what something, uh, I, this is sort of more of a comment on the scientific model, on the scientific method really. We decide what effective means. Okay, so let me give, I think the best way I could explain this is by means of an analogy. So let's say, chess came up earlier, right? Um, let's say aliens come to Earth and they see us playing chess, okay? And um, they see two people playing chess, but for some reason, these aliens are unable to distinguish black and white. They can't see colors or whatever. So they see people playing a chess board and sometimes this guy wins, sometimes the other guy wins, okay? Their best model that they can come up with is, um, it's the same as tossing a coin. It's basically 50-50. There's nothing else at play there, okay? And in a sense, I mean, it, that's the best model they would be able to come up with because their senses don't allow them to come up with other models, okay? Well, that's not to say that the fundamental truth of chess, okay, is that it's just equivalent to tossing a coin, okay? So we create models uh, and we obtain truths about them using the logic and the rules that we have designed ourselves. We created the rules. We even like... This separation of mathematics and logic, okay, is uh, artificial in the sense that we also defy, we also define logic, okay. This and this, this is true and this is true. Therefore, the conjunction is true. That's a rule we made up ourselves, okay. So even logical reasoning is anthropocentric. So everything that we do, every reasoning that we do within mathematics, is suited towards humans. Also, I, Prof. Shreha mentioned Gödel and his theorems and so on, right? So there's a sense in which if we were to sort of try to obtain fundamental truths, um, it's difficult to sort of phrase this. Stephen Wolfram has a very good, the guy who created Mathematica, you know, the program which Prof used to generate the, those five uh, things just at the beginning. Um, he says that the mathematics we chose, like there are multiple possible mathematics in a sense, right? I mean, in a sense, you could say our mathematics based on, our mathematics is very ZFC centric. Um, I'm getting a bit technical here, though I don't, I don't want to be too technical. Um, it, it, it's based on axioms, which we designed ourselves. And if we were to design a random system with any other axioms, okay, it would be very difficult to sort of get anything useful from it, right? So the, 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 the system with the game, mathematics is a game which we, which we designed ourselves. And it happens to be, it happens to mirror reality, okay? Now, one other point I want to mention, it's like, yes, I'll conclude, okay. So mathematics is also a social construct. What do I mean by this? Um, I mean, the areas that we study, Prof. Laura mentioned group theory and so on. Why, why, are this, why is the mathematics study that we study today, the mathematics that we study today? It's basically a product of history and of what people have always wanted to study, okay? I mean, historically, I don't know, I mean, the reason arithmetic exists is because people, you know, Babylonians wanted to do tax and so on, or like the geometry exists because of land surveying. Um, computers exist because of Turing and, and, and computers and cryptography, they exist because of Alan Turing and his work in World War II, right? Some people go as far as to say like the only scientific and mathematical advancements happen because of, because of war. Anyway, that's a, that's a, a comment on history sort of. Um, but yes, mathematics is a social construct. I mean, even things like funding, like if an area is popular or trendy, right? It gets a lot of funding thrown at it and it, it, it emerges into a very prosperous, big mathematical area. But does that mean it's somehow fundamentally important? Like, is it a fundamental universal truth? No, it's just people say, oh, that's cool. You know, we could probably do something with that. It's trendy, let's fund it. And, you know, do more computer things, for instance. 
But that's the point that I want to, that I, like, to summarize my entire point. Saying that mathematics is invented as opposed to discovered is not the same as saying mathematics isn't useful or mathematics uh, is not effective, right? I'm not denying the effectiveness of mathematics. I'm just saying we choose what we study and just because, because we are humans and we are limited in our senses and we choose what mathematics we study, um, and even the way we, like saying mathematics is useful because the formula agrees with reality. Reality is only what we can perceive with our senses. We can never, it's, um, it's ambitious to claim that what we discovered are fundamental truths, fundamental truths about the universe. It's just truths that we can observe from our human limited eyes. And that, uh, I'll end there. All right, thank you. So I'll move to Hebron, the Could I catch him on that? Uh, they're not fundamental truths, he said. They are truths. Yes which uh, uh, we are interested in. Okay, there are truths. That's my point. They might not be fundamental. I mean, <laughs> alien beings could come and say, ah, rah, rah, rah. I mean, you've wasted your time looking at this. That's not terribly important. I agree. Okay, it could happen. But they are there. They are truths. But what is mathematics, though? Uh, the math when I say mathematics, I think of the body of knowledge that exists. I mean, if you say, for instance, Ismail, you could just study this object in a well, groups, vector spaces are all useless. You could have just studied this object much more easily. That would imply, in my opinion, it, it would make sense to, to you say, like, vector spaces are invented, therefore, groups are invented. They're not, not useful. Not, not, so not so important. Not so important, not so uh, fundamental, as you said. But therefore, would it make sense to say we discover groups? Because it's like, it, did we this? I mean, okay, how about this? Chess. It's a, it's, another, it's a game which we really, did we discover chess. I mean, chess is a game which is interesting. A lot of people play it and so on, but maybe there's an easier game or something, right? Did we discover chess? We invented chess, no? Was okay, so, so suppose you have gold diggers mm -hmm. and you send them away. There are two cultures. One culture believes that gold uh, can be found uh, at the foot of a mountain. And another culture believes that uh, uh, it can be found in valleys. Okay. Those in valleys, they discover large amounts of gold. Okay. So that's more successful and more fundamental, sort of. Yes. While the others happen to find a few nuggets of gold. Fine. Uh, but those few nuggets which they found were there. That's my point. They, it, it's not, it wasn't correct. It wasn't the right way to look at gold under the earth's crust. Mm -hmm. uh, the right way would have been under the valleys. Those were exceptions. The nuggets that they found, but they were there. But now I think there's a bit of trickery here at play when yeah. you say the words truth. As truth, shit for sir. So in a sense, I mean, what, what, it, what, what is, as, then we get to this question. Like, the, discussion what is becomes, the, the discussion becomes technical and philosophical. Yes, what is truth? Because a mathematical truth is not the same as a, a truth in the real world, you know? like. I picked up this beer jug right now. Is that a, could you say that is the same truth as like the prime number theorem is true? Let's, let's, let's not uh, let's not rewrite the logical tractatus here. Yeah, yeah, messy. <laughs> I, I, right. I'd like to bring Jake into this picture now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, this question to him. So we just heard Luke say that uh, planets did not go around ellipses around the sun until um, the Greeks said they did, right? Sorry, so can I just clarify that ellipses did not exist, right? Because they're not some fundamental property of the universe, ellipses. We perceived them, we said, ah, yes, we could model them using an ellipse, but an ellipse is something we invented. Okay, That's so let I'm me thinking. put this question to, to Jake. Um, uh, the laws of nature have no option but to be described by the mathematics of the day. Um, so, for example, nature does not come with Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates someone had to invent those and impose them on space. Only when Newton invented his calculus could he go on to discover the laws of mechanics. Only when Riemann invented curved space could Einstein use them for general relativity. Could it be that, you know, this current progress we're seeing at the moment to discover the theory of everything is because the right mathematics has not yet been invented? Um. I'll, I'll address your, your question um, about the right mathematics. Um, the right mathematics, and I will make reference to the point Adriana made earlier, um, has more to do with the fact that perhaps uh, our city is actually a country and we've not traveled outside the borders of the city 
and uh, we've not discovered some neighboring city where the mathematics is more apt as Prof. Lowry was alluding to with his analogy about gold. Um, moving on, though, I would really like to thank Mr. Collins for the two nice birthday presents he gave me within his arguments, those of anthropocentrism and cosmic importance. And Luke was trying to tell all of you that maths is anthropocentric. And I mean, again, thank you, Luke, because this could not be farther from the truth. You know, maths, uh, let's take some examples, everyone, okay? So anthropocentric means that it is centered around humans, right? But this couldn't be farther from the truth. Take something like um, Einstein's field equations, right? Einstein's field equations tell us about how space-time is curved. They tell us also how that space-time curves due to the matter inside of it. But uh, what you can note there is that you can throw in any type of metric you want, any type of curvature you want, and not all curvature would lead to humanity. What does this mean? Very famously, string theory is based on desiter, uh, sorry, anti-desitor space-time, space-time which is negatively curved, it's curved onto itself. Our space-time expands outwards. In the case that we had anti-desitor space-time, the sun would not be close enough to the earth to provide enough heat to result in humans. And if you extend this argument outwards, you will notice that there are so many infinitely more cases where there are no humans. Maths leads to more cases of more universes without humans than universes with humans in them. And in that sense, that is the very beauty of maths. That is the cosmic importance of maths, which Luke had you believe. <laughs> Can I, can, I, okay, can I add a footnote? Like, because you mentioned anthropocentrism. By anthropocentrism, I mean also that we are the people who decide what it means for something to be correct. I mean, we are the aliens who are looking at the chessboard and we said, you know, the fundamental theory of chess is that it's basically tossing a coin and they just randomly choose, right? Like, that little, like. I'm sorry, sir, but this is not your time. You're supposed to be commenting on what I said. Can you? No, no, because you said. You said, because the whole fact, like you, 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 when you interjected my point, you said that there's all, you can always bound the error of the model and so on, right? Now, the fact that you can bound the error means that there exists an error, obviously. Now, the fact that there exists an error means that there could be other ways of looking at the game of chess or reality, which we're just leaving out because we are limited to our human senses, okay? So anthropocentrism, I mean that, this is like a critic of the scientific method, Phil Veritali, just because we look at the thing with our eyes and our ears and so on, and we see, ah, oh, yes, the experiment looks successful. It doesn't mean it's is success. Like, it doesn't mean we've discovered a fundamental law because we. Yeah, we're... Th thank you. These are nice words, but I fail to see how that means <laughs> mathematics is anthropocentric, sir. Um, anthropocentrism means that mathematics facilitates the existence of humans. It means that mathematics is created by humans for humans. And that is not how mathematics works. It's simply not. No, I mean, I mean mathematical truths are limited to humans, a bit, human senses. It's, it's like a sort of- Yes, like and I am disputing that point. Um, just to continue on the point of cosmic importance, that is the cosmic importance, right? The cosmic importance is that mathematics exists outside of us, purely outside of us. And we can see this, um, as I have been saying, that mathematics gives rise to so many universes where humans do not exist. Now, moving on, a second point about cosmic importance is, for example, the differential equation, right? Differential equations, which Luke would have you believe we created, tell us that the universe is deterministic. What does deterministic mean? Deterministic means that if I drop this, it falls into my hand, right? It didn't go back up, it, I can't reverse it, it's, it's one way, and it will always do this, right? So a, a, a deterministic uh, feature of reality is something which is predictable. It happens again and again. F equals MA is a deterministic equation. Now, Luke is saying that determinism is not something that um, is there. It's not something that's out there. No, no, no. We came up with the differential equation. We managed to create something which happens deterministically. And that's why the, the universe um, happens uh, to, to follow this, this path. That's why the universe isn't random. Well, wow, look, I mean, you must really think something of yourself. Oh. 
isn't it surely isn't it a much more reasonable statement to look to to look out there in the universe to see the apple falling from the tree to come up with gmm on r squared and to say oh wow maybe we can start calling those differential equations there are so many of them how lovely they are to study and they happen to be deterministic that's yes, what but, i but, okay thank you so i think uh, this, this is the right point to open up the discussion to questions from the audience so uh, whoever has a question please um should we vote uh, Sorry, beforehand or no i, I think it makes sense to vote afterwards then yeah. No, not right now. No, we can vote. We haven't after. finished the discussion yet. Um, so, okay, we can. We have a question from Alexander. Okay, uh, rather than a question, I have kind of several comments. Uh, first of all, um, I think this boils down to asking if humans did not exist, would mathematics exist? Because if it still would exist without humans, then mathematics is discovered. Whereas if mathematics wouldn't exist without humans, then mathematics would be invented. Because I, I think that's the fundamental question we need to ask. If we did not exist, if humans do not exist, or well, apart from humans, perhaps some other aliens who are, you know, uh, sentient beings that can reason like us and so on. So if none of none of these beings existed. Would mathematics exist? Well, I would say that suppose there, there are, for example, I don't know, um, aliens um, so out there who are also uh, sentient beings like us. Um, I would say that they would have some sort of mathematics for sure, because they would see, for example, the stars probably and they would say, look, the stars have some certain patterns, and then from can those I, patterns... Can I, can, I, can I answer you on that thing you said? Because you said okay. that think like us. Like, uh, let me underline like us. You okay, just said maybe, they, maybe they, they, they would... Like us, but they, they, no, no, but they think. would see the stars. They, they, they see like us. They, they, we're sort of like yeah. anthropomorphizing yeah, I agree, I agree these aliens. I agree with you, I agree with you. But the point is that I think if there are other aliens out there who have some sort of senses or whatever, they would still come up with some sort of mathematics because they would somehow infer patterns because mathematics after all is the study of patterns mostly. So if, if you start noticing patterns, then, then you, you, need to, you need to create some sort of mathematics somehow. But my question would be, would their mathematics be like ours? And I would say that the answer would be no. I think their mathematics wouldn't be like ours. So, it, so what I would like to say about this is that mathematics has both elements of discovery and elements of invention. It's not one or the other, it's both. Mathematics is both. It is As Alex, invention I and discovery. Hmm. Could I give, give answer? I mean, Yes, I would agree with you that if humans didn't exist, uh, the practice of mathematics, uh, the way we do it, would probably not have existed. In fact, some, some philosophers of mathematics uh, consider the S in mathematics to be a plural. There is more than one yeah, mathematics. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So I, 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 that's okay, you know. I mean, the practice yeah, of, course, of mathematics, of course, not, I, the mathematical objects would still have had those properties which we talk about now. I mean, if, for example, we were to meet an alien civilization from a faraway planet, and uh, suppose that we can communicate, because if we cannot communicate, you know, but somehow, suppose we can communicate. They never gave any importance to prime numbers, okay? But we explain to them, or they laugh at us, like, this is ridiculous. But they will understand our definition, and they will understand that according to our definition, the primes are infinite. Yeah. And can I interject what a I bit? Mean when I say they, ex they exist irrespective of humans? Mm. But yeah. they, they, before you answer, Adriana, can I ask a question oh, that Nieta has asked also? Is it possible that aliens do not have a concept of a straight line because a straight line is not really found in nature? Yes. 
I would say absolutely yes. No, I think uh, even Prof. Lauri would. I mean, the floor to Adrian. Uh, <laughs> sorry, no. yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Le, as, what I was going to say, I, I'll, I'll get to it. Uh, but there's this focus on us finding something, and it has to be really important that everyone has to has to get it right. That all the aliens and the, you have to find it in nature and it has to be true like but that's not what mathematics is it, it, it's true sort of relatively but it's always true in that sense like in in a way if i if i you know dig in the ground and i find a random rock i discovered the rock it doesn't mean the rock is important but i discovered it the rock will still be there whether i discovered it or not right and, and that's the same with the sort of relationships between arguments Right. If, if you have something, then it, it follows that there's a, a sort of relationship between that argument and that argument. And the thing about straight lines is they don't have to have the same concept of a straight line for a straight line to exist. So they can understand us when we define it and we show them the, the conclusion about how it acts then. Tipo, that's, that's what mathematics is to me. And that's what's always there, the relationships. Can I interject? Um, one thing that we may notice is that, uh, yes, their definition of a straight line may be, may be different in the sense, okay, suppose we have a being that can only perceive dots, like singular dots. They live in a sort of discrete universe. Their idea of a straight line might be that there are five dots there and no dots there. So in that sense, if they were to describe their... Uh, uh, that idea of a straight line, uh, they would be defining their straight line in that sense. So our ideas... Defining their straight line, the shortest, the shortest distance between two points, you define, you define that, right? You define what's what it this, means what the shortest. What, 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 what is, is distance? the shortest distance? Exactly. What is the shortest distance? What even is distance? Uh, that's space-time... <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Space-time with Einstein, huh? Yeah, you have so, geodesics, but... Uh, yes, it's geodesic. I mean, it's it just metric right. dependent, but right? Even, even there, even there, uh, uh, Einstein uh, realized that to explain that, for example, when you go fast, uh, you, uh, things get... Um, uh, how is it? They get... No, uh, no. Fatter, fatter. Ah. Oh, yes, uh, when you grow older, you get, get fatter. That's <laughs> <laughs> but um, and, and with, with the time dilation and so on, when, when you go fast, uh, to explain that, uh, you have to have a different concept of distance than what we have. It's not the it's, same concept of this. It's thing. just hyperbolic existence. I, I, I don't but, see the point. No, 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 no. But also, we're, we're very, being green, very, very bold, though, XO. Uh, I think we're even, I mean, we're presupposing logic, so. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I would say you are, but I am not. No, no, no. We, I, I, okay, so first of all, saying that Max is invented is the conservative point of view when it comes to boldness. So, uh, like, by default, we. We can I, see in the vote, sir. You guys are the guys saying, Isma, we made up this thing, but it's we've discovered something fundamental and deep. I'm just saying, listen, we made it up, um, enough. And Tom, you're like, we discovered, uh, it's like, this is the universe. Surely, we, surely you are This is what you guys are, are saying. You are so, playing uh, God, sir. You are playing No, God. I'm not playing you God. Create, I'm just saying, you create no. mathematics <laughs> itself. How am I less bold? No, I, I, I mean, okay. Okay, so you're saying mathematics is this ultimate thing. I'm saying mathematics is just the thing which we humans, the thing we do, every, you know, the thing we do, the thing I've been studying all these years. So what is things, some things humans made up. It's, uh, you guys are saying that it, it leads to this fundamental understanding of universe and so on. I'm saying it's a bold to say that. That's all I'm saying. But also we're presupposing that logic is so, even Alex mentioned this thing about like aliens, if they think like us and so on. It's, uh, let's not focus, not to dwell on the like us, but even logic, so uh, the rules of logic which we use in, in reasoning are also anthropocentric in the sense that they are also they are also part of mathematics. Like we can't we can't say mathematics is built on top of logic. In some sense it is, but what but the rules of logic are also things which we made up, if you know what I mean. Like 
right, you, made up, another question you made up the notion of truth, did you hear? And yes, and yes, uh, yes, logic, how? yes, truth is made up. Uh -huh. Mathematical is, truth is distinct yeah. from truth as we understand it, like did I pick up this cup or not, you know? This is precisely the question it. that uh, someone is asking here, as a news. Um, how uh -huh. can you be sure that something is true when we don't even know what truth means? Yes, yes. Very nice. I, are you addressing it to me? What are you addressing it to? Generally, yeah, I'm pushing this to the to, to Jake. Uh, to Jake. To the discovery. discussion becomes very technical and philosophical. Yes, and, yes. That's well, I, of course. I mean, Prof. Shreha alluded to Baudel earlier. Prof. Shreha alluded to Baudel earlier, and, and that's all one needs to think about, right? Once we have a system in place, a set of axioms, then there are truths you can know in the system and truths you cannot know in the system. And I think that's, that's really the end of it. We are not disputing this. But we are not. That make it relative to your system. Yes, exactly. We we are not. Uh, Technically, are not... I mean, I don't know if this makes a difference, but just to clarify, if you can do arithmetic, if your system is complicated enough to do arithmetic, if it's like if your system is basic, like like logic, you like truths are all provable in logic in first in second zero order logic. Like logic is not a, logic is a system where you can reason, and all truths are knowable there. But if, you, if it's complicated enough that you can do arithmetic, then that's when get this theorem kick in. So I'll carry on, Jake, sorry. There's another question from, from Nadine here. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, could it be that, okay, nature acts the way it does, but mathematics is just a language to describe what happens. So it's not true or false, it's just a description, it's just a language. Okay. I, I, is it the description of something which happens? Yes. I have to ask, like, what is mathematics? Is, is, <laughs> math is, is it, do you, can you really say um, mathematics is what we call numbers? Like, we call two something completely different, you know? Like, if, if I'm talking to you in a language, you understand what my words mean beyond what the words actually are, right? When I talk about the concept, the concept, it exists beyond the word. If if I'm talking to someone um, German and, and they have words for everything, they can explain to me a concept and I'll still get it, you know? Like Schadenfreuden, which is like happiness is at, at, at the misfortune of others. Someone can, you don't need the word for the concept to exist, you know? I think this is a very good point because this was another like thing which I never brought up in my argument, but it, it was in my arsenal, if you like. I wanted to mention this. Like, the, the issue with, with truth, because we're going on about truth, the only way, because if there's a physical problem, what do we do? So well, we translate it into mathematics. And then the truth, we, we have, the problem is that mathematics is the only language we can speak when it comes to truths about nature and so on. Like, the only language we are able to speak is mathematics. We can't use another language, you know? We can't type Mathematics pr plural. There's many. No, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. But okay. Yeah, that's a different sort of. Good. But 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 what I mean is, there are different mathematics. Yes, yes. But the sort of reasoning which we do, right? We we have to establish a system with rules, right? And that, that's what mathematics is like. You you create a system and you create the rules for that system. We the, we you can't do mathematics without saying, listen, these are my rules. You have to give me the rules. So so if you're gonna make up a random mathematics in the plural sense. Um, you have to give me the rules for that mathematics and how it works, basically. And yes, it... if you have the natural numbers, you want induction there, oh. like, you know? Per example, yes, that, yes, that, yes, that. But you have to define, you have to axiomatize those guys. You have to create the rules yourself. You say these are the rules. Yeah. This, no, no, this but you're, you works. created induction, right? You didn't discover induction, you created it, look. Or else... Okay, there's another question from uh, Roman. And um, he's saying, uh, well, I, I can point out to two objects, right? I can make sense of fractions. I can even make sense of real numbers like pi. But the imaginary number i, can you point that to us? Isn't such an unnatural number like i an imagined number, a work of fiction? Can, can I, can I, uh, so, so I would say this is trying to support Luke's point. So if Luke <laughs> wants to make a point here, he can, but I, I can answer this, uh, so, so. Go ahead. Go, ahead, so, go ahead. Imaginary numbers are a really great thing in physics, right? So if if um, if you're, you what you're saying is that you feel that they have no 
Uh, like if you can make sense of a fraction, why? Because you're eating a pizza and you know what half a pizza is, so that makes sense. Um, imaginary numbers are a geometric consequence of the ideas of superposition, of interference. They are a result of waves in some sense. So when you look at the water and there are two ripples and they bump into each other and then the middle becomes bigger, that's because you have some terms in there with an I somewhere in there and they cause that addition. Without them, we would not have this. Of course, there are more fundamental things to say here, but at a very literal level, that is a reason for why I is there. So I think, in, in my opinion, this this worry about I or somehow feeling, I think it's it's a very naive, you know, I don't want to diss the person who asked the question or anything, but I think it's a naive view of number systems in the sense that the biggest leap, in my opinion, and even historically, this sort of agrees with my take, is that the biggest leap is not going from the reals to the imaginary numbers, it's going from the rationals to the reals, in the sense that... Um, the, the reals are a very complicated construct to sort of define properly. So like to, to get to, to create a number system which behaves the way the reals do, unless you just assume they exist, right? Um, it's a very complicated system. Prof. Lowry, like actually, like I remember Prof. Lowry in his lectures, he always mentions something like the intermediate value theorem, which is a very nice justification for like why the reals should exist and so on. Um, but still, I think like if you're going about, if you, if you come from a place where you, you assume that numbers are either whole things like one, two, three, or like whole things divided in certain amounts, like you split something into seven and that, then you get a seventh or something, or like three on 57, you get these fractions. But pi and these numbers, which are irrational, which cannot be written as fractions, like what does it even mean? A number which you cannot think of as a quantity, as a subdivision of, of, of a larger quantity. It's a very deep idea, like pi square root of two, all these numbers which crop up, which are not rational. Those are much more difficult to sort of build into a system. Sort of. Look, I'm, look, uh -huh. that's something even more naive. First of all, mm -hmm. in the history of mathematics, there were moments when uh, negative numbers, uh, there was doubt whether they existed. You know, what were negative numbers weren't accepted. Exactly. Uh, in 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 uh, in Al Khwarizmi's, uh, I think, uh, book of algebra on the quadratic, there are several cases. Uh, because if there's a negative number, he has to put it on the other side, so everything is positive, you know. Yes, yes. But let, but let me take something something a, a bit more more physics, more physically, because I think that physics started when. Yes, can I please stop you for a second? Just a second. Um, uh, Luke, can you please open the voting for the second okay. time so that I think you can start voting at the moment? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, I think if you visit vote.maths.mt at the moment, it is, I mean, you can check, but All right. from okay. my end, how do you check it? Just refresh the page. I mean, if, if the page looks okay. weird, like like it used Which to. Which page? I don't even have the page. Vote. Dot, uh, I'm going to share screen. It's, 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 it's okay, so look, uh, Blank is vote on the result of the first poll. So I imagine that's what that looks like. As that. If you visit this, I'm a refresh prof. It should the look. High, high, yes. You should be able to vote again, okay? Yes, that. And you can see the result of the first poll as well. If you scroll down. I don't know. I don't know. All right. So, so we had some convincing. Anyway, anyway, you I can mean, continue. You know, uh, I think physics, for example, I mean, became what it, what it is when it started talking about things which are invisible to us, which we don't feel. Let, let me take a very naive example. If you talk to somebody who hasn't done any physics, it's, it's of him a simple pendulum. And you ask him, at what point is the pendulum going fastest? Yeah? Obviously, I mean, it's slow at the very end, yeah? and it's very fast in the middle. But then ask him, uh, at what point is the acceleration maximum? It's very difficult to, to understand that when it is stationary at those points, that's where the maximum acceleration is. And at the bottom, when the velocity is, is, is uh, highest, its acceleration is zero at that instant. This was Galileo. I think, I think this was one of the great things. And then Maxwell field theories. Now, nowadays, mm -hmm. physics is more abstract. That's what I tell my students. Physics is more abstract than mathematics. You know, sometimes. I think. Well, okay. but, but, there are, but there are a lot of, of situations like the square root of minus one where, yes, I mean, we've gone beyond 
our imagination. Let's take, let's take multiple dimensions. Okay, it seems so abstract. Who are the people nowadays who are really concerned with multiple dimensions? Uh, people at Netflix, at Amazon, who are designing, who are designing recommender systems. Each one of us is a point in multi-dimensional space, maybe an infinite dimensional space. So they can then suggest to us where to go for a holiday, what books to buy, and so on. Yes, but multi dimensions. Huh? But multi dimensions, right? Don't you say that they were created? We didn't find them. Yes, yes. Very they well. were created and then people found applications for them using the created mathematics. No, I mean... They discovered them because they saw connections. That's it. I mean, that, it, this is just... But, but okay, actually, okay. Sometimes so, I think so, it's a play of words. I, uh -huh. because, I suppose a civilization... <laughs> You, you, uh, Joseph asked for a civilization if they if if they they don't have the idea of a straight line. Suppose a civilization lives very close to a black hole. Uh, would it be that uh, for them they would have discovered relativity first, yeah? and then a big Einstein come afterwards who would who would say. Ah, uh, I mean, uh, if we go away uh, from where we are, you know, I mean, who discovered his own mechanics later? For them, the fact that there are four dimensions of it, that there's time, it might be more natural. So I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer your question and decidedly say we we have invented it. I mean, yes, okay, maybe that aspect of doing the mathematics, you know, but still, I mean. Orthogonality, you know, we've gone so far away with it. Emma, that, that, yet, prof. Yet, yet Fourier transforms and Fourier series, do they exist or do they not exist? Exactly. Uh, can, can, I, can I like add a, a footnote to this? I mean, of course, there are certain things. We, think we, we sort of, we tend to be inspired by physical things, right? To define mathematical ideas. But then when we sort of develop them further and further, in, in a lot of cases, they become more and more abstract and mathematical and have less to do with their original, where they came from. I, I mean, even, so for instance, there's a lot of ugly things. I mean, some people don't call them ugly, but I think they're like ugly consequences of the way we formalize mathematics. Like, they didn't come up during the debate, but then there are sort of points which you guys should address. Like the Banachtarsky paradox, for instance, is a, is a very counterintuitive thing, like, you know, that you can get a sphere and break it into two spheres of identical volume. Or the fact that if you use ZFC, for instance, and you model the natural numbers in the usual way as von Neumann ordinance, two is an element of three. What, what, what does that mean? Two is an element uh, when of three. When they reached beyond that, what do you think? What do you think? The first paradox reached beyond you created it as, as a human. Yeah, as you in, are telling us it is so. Wait. Hare, hare, are, like, no, no, a moment. You are telling us it is so strange and, and it is so incomprehensible. And, and yet we know it is true because Matt told us. And I am here saying we discovered that it's fundamental. Of course, a paradox appears because we are discovering it. And you are telling us we create paradoxes. Our what thing. I'm saying, what yeah, I'm saying is, it, it, is, it, is it is meaningless. Like the Banach-Tarski paradox is a consequence of the way we chose to observe it. We, uh, so like I said, mathematics is a game. We make up the rules. We made up the rules. Like, I don't know if the, the non-tech, the, the, the members of the audience, if they're not familiar with ZFC, it's basically the axioms, the main axioms we choose for maths, like these nine axioms, which we build everything off, off of. You can always, like, if geometry, everything can be termed, everything can be described in terms of these nine axioms that we have. Um, but the, these axioms have very ugly consequences, ugly in the sense, I mean, I wouldn't say, some people that would, would get angry at me if I call them ugly, but what I mean by ugly is they have no meaning, mandomsh parallel in the real world. The Banatarsky has no parallel in the real world. It's a consequence of yes. the yes. anthropocentrism hmm. of, of mathematics. Like we said, Isma el Metz, regoli. These are the rules of mathematics that we chose. It's not even a straight line. A straight line doesn't have any parallel in the real world. You cannot see a straight line because as soon as you see it, you're saying it's not a straight line. Yes, but 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 then we create notions again. Like this is the issue. This is like so, so here uh -huh. here we we're becoming fundamental. So how do we have this concept of a straight line? 
I mean, th- th- this, we're in agreement. We're in agreement because so many things are approximately a straight line, but nothing is a straight line. This, Wait, this, yeah. this the light coming into your eyes yeah. that is a straight line. Yeah. Yeah. Approx- yeah. Approximately, yeah. Yeah. Lagrange equation. Yeah. approximately a straight line, not a straight line. Okay. May I give my okay. opinion okay. here? Questions as possible from the audience. Um, Who's this? A comment by Shandri. Okay, okay, let's not talk about nature, he's saying. Let's talk about proofs. Um, uh, there's uh, Paul Erdos, right, a very well-known yeah. mathematician, who, who has uh, has written about what he calls the book, right, and these proofs that he kind of says that God has given, and that we're simply discovering them. Now, let me put this question this way: uh, Fermat's last theorem was conjectured in 1637, right, and by Fermat, and it was proved by Wilde in 1994. So at what stage did it actually become mathematics? In 1637, in 1994, or was it always true? Uh, the, uh, Gauss wasn't interested in it. He thought, you know, you could make up these things. They're not really important. Gauss uh, wasn't interested. Yeah, yeah, I, think, I, think, I didn't yeah. know this. I, I mean, the, the, the it depends the what you mean by mathematics, Tom. Depends so what you mean by it. part of it. I mean, I don't think either of us, as you say, when did it become? I don't think either of our sides of the argument think there is a temporal nature to mathematics. I don't think there is a temporal nature. At least the temporal nature is when we make up the axioms. I mean, but if someone, so I, you know, someone came up with the axioms of a group at whatever year, I don't know, I, I, I don't know the history of group theory, but had someone come up with the axioms of group theory, 200 years prior, then obviously there is a temporal nature in that sense. But but um, what I mean is we invent the axioms, you know, like like the, the temporal nature. I, I don't like things come into existence when we describe them. So I would say that groups existed in, in the only meaningful way you could interpret the word exist. I think Prof. Lauer will disagree with me here, though. The, the groups existed when the first person defined the idea of a group. That was it the first person. So, I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, the exomatization w- was, I mean, to rearrange uh, what had been known for several years, what had been used. But what I, t- I tell my students, you know, I mean, uh, when we give you, uh, Professor Shri, you know, and all of us, when we in five minutes give you the axioms of something, we are probably compressing 100 years of history into those five, 10 minutes. You know, as if, uh, you know, people, uh, somebody sat down and said, what am I going to do today? Oh, let me invent groups. Mm-hmm. Right, so. Could I ask a question? Because, I mean, you were saying, uh, I don't know, uh, other, other civilizations, other, I mean, they don't have the idea of a straight line. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't they? No, I'm I mean, saying, I'm not saying I disagree. I'm saying no, so, you, so you said you, you, you agreed with me when I said that these things have no parallel in the real world and a straight line sort of doesn't, but some might say it, it does approximately. Um, they might describe, I mean, why do we use straight lines? I don't know. I mean, in a sense, straight lines are very useful to us. What's coming to mind, I, obviously, they're useful in the end of themselves, but also they describe things. We use them to describe things like smoothness and this differentiability and so on. They're basically consequences of straight lines. They could describe these notions using other things, you know. I mean, they could they could somehow okay. see. Okay, so suppose they have some other notion, okay, and which captures they des- and-, and they describe that to us, mm-hmm. and they tell us, look, uh, these these two things, if you put them together, this will happen. This will happen. Uh, will we be able to say, ah, yes, you're right? I mean, because the, the problem with that question is, we're assuming that they have the same logic as us. What if their intuition is, for instance, or something, you know, like when they reject the law of the excluded middle or something, I and mean, there are these little nuanced things. They re- Fundamentally, we're assuming their capacity to reason is as the same as ours, in a sense. We have no idea how they would reason about things. And if they would reason differently, maybe they can come to completely different observations about the world, which are equally statistically true, you know? Like, like I- But the planets would still go around in an ellipse, huh? <laughs> approximately an ellipse, approximately, approximately an, ellipse. an ellipse, and maybe they describe, they, maybe they have some fundamental care for some fundamental thing. Now, because it, it's, really, it's, it's come to my attention that it's been 90 minutes, and I see how not, yes. and uh, I think it is time that we 
uh, review the vote. second vote uh, and review start the second voting vote. the event. Because these poor people, they've been listening to us shout at each other for 90 <laughs> minutes now, and, and we yes. should really stop the okay, torture. So I'll, I'll for stop the, May I add a comment on what I think about the debate, ultimately, so, after listening to it? Mela, uh, John, oh, it's, it's nice to hear your voice being in the one. Hey, Avera, Avera. Mela, I started the debate by thinking that both discovery and creation are necessary for mathematics. And I end up the debate by still thinking the same. And the reason is that, first of all, mathematics is created because it is our way of understanding the universe around us. So we need to create the language. If there would be an alien civilization, they might create an entirely different language, which, would, which wouldn't correspond to our mathematics, but they would be understanding the same uh, universe that we live in. So that's one thing. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, let me think, because I forgot. Well, that's definitely the, the bottom line. So mathematics is both discovered and created. And if I remember what I had to say also, I'll come again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Right. So Cheers, I think John. that wraps up the debate. Can, can we close the debate here? Or do you How do we vote? My session Siva. Uh, more votes dot, um, uh, let me share the uh, vote dot mass dot empty. I think we've done some convincing, yeah. Like, are there any other comments from the crowd whilst we're uh, I'm gonna refresh the, the vote system? May I not add to you? I don't have to do that. That's not that. I share the screen, Prof Muscat. Ma dakta Prof Muscat, but I don't let me start. Now, my votes dot mass vote more dot mass dot empty votes. Not. I'll share you the link in the chat here. Matt? Mm -hmm. I think okay. Steph, has, Steph has a comment. Steph, would you like to go ahead? Yes. Um, I kind of like didn't want to mention it because it's not exactly like whether Matt is created or destroyed. Like my view was, as Jonathan said, like I think both of them play a role, but and I still think like that. Um, my question was mainly to you, Jake. You said in your argument against Luke, about whether math is anthropocentric or not. I don't know what I'm saying it was, but whatever. Um, you said that math gives us um, the fact that the universe, there are more universes where humans cannot exist than the universe, the one single universe where human can exist. And you use that as your argument against like maths is the opposite of anthropocentric. Um, I can't see why that proves that maths is not anthropocentric because that's just, Okay, we've developed the maths to describe that. And that is just telling us that opens up a whole new debate. Like it's just telling us that we live in a very special universe. So it's not really telling us anything about the maths. We've have, we still invented the maths with our perception as a human. All of maths is created or discovered, but still, if it is, let's say it's discovered because that's like my main stance it's still discovered from the eyes of a human. It has to be a little bit anthropocentric. It can't be, we're not explaining everything. We don't explain stuff which we don't even begin to understand, for example. Uh, I think it's, it's a very good comment. Um, I would say just to, like the last thing you said, you said we don't uh, come up with things which we can't even describe. Is that what you said? You can't even begin to understand. I would argue that we do this all the time. I mean, I've never gone, I, I cannot visualize a tesseract. I cannot, I cannot walk um, enough. I cannot walk in anti space. I cannot walk into a black hole, but I, know, but I know approximately what interiors do. I can't tell, uh, enough, we describe 40, 14 dimensional Calabiao manifolds. You know, we, we can do these things, but we cannot begin to imagine them. So. So I, I would say, Lee, I, I disagree on that specific yeah, point. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. About, yeah. and about what you were saying about uh, the fact that uh, sort of math is actually anthropocentric. I think it's an interesting point in the sense that what you're saying is that this language was created by humans. I do exactly. not discount that. Obviously, this language was created by humans. The letters we use, the notation we use, this is all human artifact. I don't know. The fact that there is set theoretic maths and category theoretic maths. That's a human artifact. But um, 
I do think that it is remarkable that something which someone claims is anthropocentric gives rise to something which is so much bigger. To me, yes, that is a claim against anthropocentrism. Um, perhaps, you know, you're, you're welcome to disagree. But to me, it is. To me, it is. The fact that something which is supposed to be made for, uh, for humans, by humans, gives you so much more. To me, it's, it's very readily a claim against it. Because how can it be something made for humans? Uh, take the inner product, for example. We do not only have the Euclidean inner product, which describes the world we live in. We have so many more. You know, it's not anthropocentric, and that's my understanding of it. So I, I hope that uh, sort yeah, of. Yeah, I think I think you're here. I side. think like the thing that I took away is that okay, yes, maths is not anthropocentric, but the way we describe it has to be. It has to be influenced by our human nature. We mm -hmm. can't just say maths is completely just maths. The okay, way so we describe it is affected by us. Obviously, so I don't want to. As in, this is obvious for sense. Obviously, if we make up an alphabet or something, the symbols are going to be, you know, if an alien made up symbols, we'll say, but even yeah. what, when I say that it's anthropocentric, I mean the things we consider, the objects that we choose to study, the objects we ended up making up, groups, specter spaces, and so on, those are anthropocentric. I would claim that aliens would come up with completely different objects, right? Like Prof. Laurie gave the analogy of gold diggers, find, coming to certain diff truths through different means and so on. And those different means, I imagine Prof. Laurie meant by that analogy is that the objects themselves would be different. The objects that they chose to study, we, they might obviously, be, there might be some, you know, one would hope that there would be some non-empty intersection. A, a, li a limit, a limit is anthropocentric, is a limit, the notion of Ava, a limit. Ava, Ava, I would say so, I would say so. Why is I mean, Zeno's paradox a paradox? Newton, Newton didn't, Newton did calculus without, uh, you know, li a limit was Cauchy's thing, in my Zeno's, opinion. Zeno's paradox would not be a paradox if he, if limits were not anthropocentric, oh, were anthropocentric. If limits were anthropocentric, humans would inherently understand limits, and Zeno's paradox would not be a paradox. All right, so let's conclude this. this <laughs> and, <laughs> and I put the question to, to Luke again, just for oh. just to just to end this stuff. Um, the very fact that we're communicating with each other across, you know, from from the comfort of our home, uh, relies on the fact that millions of electrons across thousands of miles behave in exactly the same way that mathematics says they should. Uh, are you so presumptuous to say that? And we've actually invented this. So I would say that electrons, again, electrons are just something which we've observed and we choose to label as electrons, but it had someone else, some other civilization or whatever, identified certain patterns in the world and so on and chose to label them by a different terminology or something, or they wouldn't even look the same as electrons. The electrons are things we've managed to observe or label or, or, or encounter because of our senses and the way we interact with the world. If other civilizations interact with the world in a completely different way, they might encounter completely different objects, different things which they might label and so on. But they have different extent. laws of physics, you're saying, different laws of mathematics. Yes. I mean, it, okay, so in some sense, obviously, they might be, I wouldn't say they might be equivalent because, again, there is an error. There's a fundamental error which cannot be escaped. Like they are not, uh, it's not a theory which encompasses everything. Right, but the issue is um, their error might be worse or better than ours. Right, but the truth is not something. Uh, uh, mathematics is just a way that we've sort of a path we've built ourselves at trying to approach, the in this sense of the physical sense, because uh, then there's other mathematics which is not concerned with truth at all, like these things like uh, inaccessible ordinals and so on, which are purely axiomatic and have no real world sort of interpretation, at least not to my knowledge. Um, there's mathematics which definitely is does have not does not have real world interpretations. Um, I think I I think I paused in the middle of a sentence and I forgot which sentence it was. Emma, basically, uh, yes. this is an electron, <laughs> an equation, an electron. We have never seen an electron, and mm. uh, we we see uh, uh, physicists ask mathematicians to produce an equation to define an electron. And this is what's, what happens all the time. In that sense, we mean creation. 
Although we, <laughs> it seems we didn't convince enough people. And may I pose a question for the creation side because I remembered what I had to say. So usually there's this strong idea that theory precedes observation. What do I mean by this? That if I observe an apple to fall from a tree and I observe that the apple was gravitationally pulled to the earth, my observation is presupposing the theory of gravitation. I am using the theory of gravitation to explain why, to explain my observation of saying that the apple uh, was pulled down to the earth. And even in mathematics, if you come up with an axiom, so you are creating an axiom, you still create an axiom within a context. You are solving a problem, you are doing something. So how would you tackle this question, let's say? Uh, except perhaps where you cannot undo as Einstein did and create new axioms counter to what we knew before, for example. Uh, where he said, um, he said uh, the, the maximum velocity we can have is that of light, which isn't realistic. Why should we stop at the velocity of light? Also, Einstein could not accept, for example, what he uh, obtained the Nobel Prize for, which is the, the concept of the photon. He thought that uh, many red, for example, red bulbs would be able to knock off an electron uh, and they cannot. Why? Because it doesn't depend on the color. Uh, it doesn't depend on the intensity. It depends on the color. And then a single bulb of ultraviolet will do it. And Einstein, although he discovered this and obtained the Nobel Prize for it, so this was outside the box, totally created by him in a way to describe his observations. But Irene, Irene. Uh, yes. I think, I think that is in fact quite the opposite. So he created a theory, you were saying, mm -hmm. uh, which then gave him back things which he didn't believe in. I mean, uh, he did, it's was, not that he didn't believe in. Or did it it's accept. against against traditional physics. Yes, but so he can... started to believe no, something no, that else. Example, then. I mean, that example of the apple falling. If somebody creates a theory which explains perfectly the apple falling and nothing else, fine. But if he starts off by that's what he's interested in. Why is that apple falling? And that theory then describes a whole lot of other things. And a hundred years later, is describing phenomena which he didn't even imagine would happen. You would say, did he create all of that? Did no, he create he, something? He didn't create the, I think, the I universe. Think, right, he didn't sorry, create I, I think, I what think really. I think we really need to start um, closing off the debate. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like to just say we cannot exceed the speed of light, guys. Everyone, uh, you know, please say this before you go to sleep tonight. Um, and, uh, we cannot exceed eight o'clock. <laughs> and, yes, and also, uh, just the, the last thing from my end is that I, and I'm someone who, who does physics primarily, I would say physics is created, maths is not, maths is discovered. Um, uh, so, uh, that would be also my take. So electrons are created, but math is not. Math is discovered. Um, anyway, uh, and that's... physics is created. Yeah, yes, I would say physical <laughs> physical models. <laughs> you debate. Uh, yes, <laughs> all your all your debate. Physical models are created. Yes. Anyway, um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for for coming, for your attention, for the panelists uh, who I think gave you know a very enthusiastic and and impassioned debate. Uh, enough a round of applause for everyone. Uh, I, I won't hear your claps. In my, you know, I'm sure you're clapping in <laughs> Um And I guess we should announce the, the results, right? So, Prof. Muscat. If I interpret it uh, correctly, um, the same number of undecided has remained, right? Nine and nine. So, we haven't managed to convince uh, the undecided, but. Maybe we, maybe we convince some people and confuse yes, some others. Yeah. Who thought that mathematics was invented went up from 24% to 33%. Whereas the people who thought it was discovered before, 54%, went down to 45%. <laughs> so 
So I think I think the <laughs> that mathematics was created has won the debate. <laughs> hey. hey, congratulations, teammates! Congrats. <laughs> uh, thank you all for your questions and dances. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the event and uh, learned something from it. So let's make amends and agree that we invented the concepts but discovered their properties. <laughs> <laughs> nice compromise. Uh, also, like one little sort of a uh, bit of begging, I suppose, to those who like, if you want to support the MMS, I mean, it's written there, but I thought I might as well say it. If you want to support the MMS and so on, just like, like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram so that you can keep up to date with our upcoming events and so on. And we'd love to have everyone who attended today attend our future events. We, yes, and if, if you have any, uh, any other event in mind that you'd like us to do, please let us know. Yes, yes. Um, we're always happy to accommodate um, uh, what you guys have in mind. Um, I don't, Prof. I don't know if, if you had closing remarks with with regards to the debate or uh, like no. Okay, so I guess I'll just close off the event. Um, uh, you know, again by by thanking everyone who came, especially uh, the lecturers, Prof. Muscat, Prof. Shriha, and Prof. Lowry. Uh, I think Prof. Peter Borch is in attendance as well. You know, uh, your participation. Uh, of course, really helps the younger generations. One understand that you don't have to be special to do maths, or or we sh and we shouldn't be afraid of lectures. So I think it's great that you you are participating. Um, thank you to everyone who came, especially six formers. I know that this was maybe uh, a bit, you know, maybe different from what you you are used to at school. And even I know today we have people that you know don't do maths most of the time and that's that's really cool too so thank you to everyone for coming like luke said i, I hope to see you again uh here in the in the next event um it was really nice uh, and thank you from my end i don't know if luke wants to say something more um, i basically agree with what you said and eventually hopefully in the not too distant future it would be nice to see you all in person as well Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night. I'm going to end Bye. the Zoom call here. Good night. Cheers. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.